Welcome back. This is my eighth update on the crisis and with each one I keep hoping that it will be the last one. But clearly there's more room left to run and more lessons to learn. So in this update, in addition to doing what I've done on, on, on the previous updates, show where the damage in stocks has been greatest and where it's been least, which regions of the world have been doing better and which ones worse, I'm going to also look at, use this crisis to answer three big questions. The first is the battle between value and growth. This is a battle that's been going on for a century for U.S. stocks. And for much of that history, value stocks seem to have won the battle. In what sense, low price to book stocks and low price earnings ratio stocks have done better than high price to book or price earnings ratio stocks over the long term. But that seemed to be reversed in the last decade. And when value investors were pushed, pushed on this issue, their response was, hey, wait for a crisis. There's going to be a correction and we're going to go back to winning. Well, we're going to get a chance to see whether that started with this crisis. The second is the battle between active and passive investing. For much of the last decade, active investing has been losing market share to passive investing vehicles, index funds and ETFs. Here again, active investors said, well, that's because you're in a momentum market and you're being rewarded for just being on a passive vehicle. In a crisis, you're going to see why we matter. Well, here's your chance. You're in a crisis. Let's see if active investing is starting to pay off. And finally, I want to revisit something that's become part of mythology, at least in finance and valuation, that there's a small cap premium. It shows up in investors buying small cap funds and small cap stocks, expecting to be rewarded just for buying small cap stocks. And in valuation, it shows up as a premium that gets added when you value small cap companies. It's a small cap premium. Maybe this crisis will allow that small cap premium, which seemed to have disappeared, not just in the last decade, but over the last four, to come back. So value versus growth, active versus passive, small cap versus large cap. As I, uh, before we get to those issues, let's le do what we've done in previous updates. Let's look at how the damage has played out. And now that we're about 10 weeks in, we can look at this crisis, at least so far, as being divided into two phases. Between February 14th and March 20th, the market was in a complete downward spiral. Between March 20th and May 1st, which is the last day that I use for this update, the market has recovered somewhat. Just to give you a sense of perspective, I've looked at indices broken down by part of the world, the Americas, Europe, and you can see across the world, the damage, if you look at the entire time period, has been significant. But in some markets, the damage has been much greater than others. In fact, if you look at Asia, Shanghai is pretty close to breaking even, even if you go back all the way through this crisis. Other markets are down 20% to 30%, and some are down only 15%. Globally, stocks are down about 17%. U.S. stocks, depending on the index, are down 15 16 17%, though the NASDAQ is down less than the S&P 500. The worst affected indices seem to be in Europe and parts of Latin America. So we'll come back to this and look more closely at stocks broken down. So that's the indices. Now, as this has happened, not surprisingly, U.S. Treasuries have also reacted. The bulk of the fall in the U.S. Treasuries happened in the first two weeks, where yields dropped significantly across the board. The three-month T-bill rate went from 1.59% to close to zero, and it stayed there since. The 10-year T-bond rate dropped from 1.59% to 0.6%, and it stayed there since. So the Treasury yields have dropped, and that's not surprising. In a crisis, you get that flight to safety. As Treasury yields have dropped, though, corporate bond spreads have widened. Here again, early on, the first week or two, the corporate bond market held up remarkably well. And then it seemed to wake up to the fact there was a crisis, and it started going to downward spiral. It hit absolute bottom, at least based on my updates, around April 3rd. So if you look at the increase in default spreads in every single ratings class, they almost tripled in some ratings classes between February 14th and April 3rd. Since then, there's been somewhat of a comeback where the, yields have, the spreads have dropped back down, but they're still significantly higher than they were pre-crisis. Along the way, I've also kept track of equity risk using my implied equity risk premium, where I measure what the market is demanding as a price for risk based on the level of the index on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, repeating what I've said in previous updates, we started this crisis with the equity risk premium at about 4.8%. And if you didn't adjust for the fact that earnings and cash flows are going to drop in the index, if you went with the stale earnings and cash flows, and to be honest, that's not my fault, 
companies are not updating earnings and cash flows on a daily basis. On April 23rd of 2020, the equity risk premium for the S&P 500 is 7.75%. Now, I admit that's probably an overstatement of the equity risk premium because I'm holding cash flows and earnings fixed. And we know this crisis is going to do damage to both. If I build in an expectation of a significant drop in earnings, a 30% drop in earnings this year, with the recovery of some of that drop, but not all of it over the following four years, and a drop in cash flows, especially in buybacks of about 50%, I get a lower equity risk premium, but even with that lower number, the equity risk premium hit about 6% now on, on March 23rd of 2020. And it's in, even if you look towards the end of the period, it's come back down, but it's still higher than it was on February 14th. In fact, if you look at my COVID adjusted equity risk premium, which I've taken to calling this number that I get by using lower earnings and cash flows, it was at 5.39% on May 1st, as opposed to the 4.8% on February 14th. Not a big increase in equity risk premiums. And that's a question I will leave it up to you. Has the market kind of over or not adjusted enough to the fact that there's real risk to the economy from the, from the virus? I also have looked at two commodities, gold, I'm sorry, co copper and oil. Why those two? Because the, the, the two are sensitive to what happens to the economy. And if you look at copper prices, you see a predictable drop a drop of about 11 to 12 percent, which makes sense given the fact that the global economy is going to slow down. But if you look at oil, it's a different game altogether. Oil prices are down 50 to 60 percent. Brent crude is down more than 50 percent. And West Texas crude is down even more. In fact, the reason I've graphed the two separately is on April 19th of, this, uh, of 2020, we had a phenomenon we'd never seen in the oil market before. West Texas crude traded it below zero. Why? Because there was no space to store the oil. So you're trying to sell oil, you have to pay people to take oil away. But there's definitely something else going on in the oil market that goes beyond the global economy slowing. Whether it's a fight between Saudi Arabia and Russia, or whether it's a long-term plan to bring down U.S. shale oil, I'm not sure. But clearly the oil market has taken on a life of its own. Finally, looking at gold and Bitcoin, Oh, it has kind of held its own. It's up about 7% over this crisis. But for many investors who are true believers in gold, they're a little disappointed. They were hoping that gold would be up more because after all, this is a big crisis, but it's up about 7%. Bitcoin are paired with gold because there are some people who've argued that Bitcoin is the millennial version of gold, an asset you're going to go to because you don't trust paper currencies. Well, if that's the reason you're buying Bitcoin, you're probably deeply disappointed because Bitcoin hasn't held up. In fact, over this crisis, Bitcoin has behaved more like stocks, like a risky asset than as a crisis asset. So it's not worked its, its magic as a currency and it's not holding up as a millennial gold. You've got to find a different rationale for holding Bitcoin. Now, as with the previous updates, I'm going to look at how the damage varies across regions, across sectors and across industries. First, looking across regions, here's what you see. China has been the least damaged region since February 14th, but maybe because that's because I started on February 14th. The Chinese markets were in free fall before February 14th. But if you look across markets, the market that has been hurt the most in this crisis is actually Latin America. In fact, emerging markets have felt the pain more than developed markets. And that's not unusual. In crises, even if they originate in developed markets, emerging markets will see that crisis magnify. That's a country risk factor playing up. Now, if you look across sectors, there's actually a fairly predictable effect across sectors. Healthcare has held up the best, and that makes sense. You have a health-related crisis. That's exactly what you'd expect. Consumer staples, pretty good, less than down less than 10%. The worst affected sector over the entire period has been financials. Banks might not have been at the center of this crisis as they were in 2008, but they always feel the reflected pain. In what sense? Well, if oil companies and airlines stop paying off their debt, guess who feels the pain? The banks who've lent them the money. So in banks, you're getting a sense of how much damage there might be coming from defaults on debt. And those defaults on debt are going to be driven by economic slowdowns. Now, looking at industries, again, you get a fairly sensible play in terms of what you see as differences in damage. Big infrastructure businesses 
a smattering of, of energy companies, um, you see the damage greatest in businesses which have big upfront investments. You're saying why? Because they tend to borrow money. In fact, I'm convinced that if you have an infrastructure company that hadn't borrowed money, you wouldn't see as much damage. Now, if you look at the companies that have been least damaged, you see a few healthcare companies. You also see a lot of online companies. I've been wrestling with what it is that's allowed some companies to do better in the crisis. And I'll throw out a hypothesis that I plan to return to in a future post. Companies that have been able to scale up quickly and scale down quickly have been able to deal with this crisis much better than companies that are locked in. And that's why I think technology companies have done be much better than manufacturing companies. But the one thing to note as you look across this damage is while you might see chaos in how the market is playing out, this has been a room, remarkably orderly crisis in terms of how the damage has been meted out. It doesn't look like chaos to me. In fact, there seems to be order behind how the market has behaved over much of the last few weeks. So now let's use the crisis to answer those three big questions. First, let's look at value versus growth. To give you some long-term perspective first, let's look at the difference between value and growth. Now, the lazy way of categorizing value, value and growth stocks, which many services use, is if you buy low, high PE or high price to book stocks, those are growth stocks, and low PE and low price to book stocks are value stocks. It's a way not just services, but academics have often classified value and growth, and it's incredibly lazy because it seems to suggest that only value investors care about value and growth investors don't. I think that's ridiculous. In fact, the best way to think about dif the difference between value and growth stocks is to use a structure I've used in pretty much everything I teach, corporate finance, valuation, investment philosophies, where I look at a financial balance sheet. Now, break a company down into assets in place, investments it's already made, and growth assets. So to give you a contrast, last year when Levi Strauss and Lyft both went public in the first quarter, I pointed out that they both might be companies going public, but Levi Strauss was a company with much more investment in assets in place, much more of its value coming from investments it had already made. Lyft, on the other hand, was a company where much of its value came from future growth potential. It's nothing good or bad about it. There are just differences in where the company is in the life cycle. Here's the way I would contrast value and growth investing. Value investors believe that their primary edge is, is in assessing that the value of assets in place. In fact, they believe that markets are more likely to mess up on valuing existing investments, assets in place, and that they should be buying stocks which are trading at low values based on their assets in place. So you go back all the way to Ben Graham's screens to pick stocks, to Warren Buffett's assessment of a value stock. This is what you see in common. Your target companies will tend to be mature companies with significant value in assets in place where you think the market's made a mistake. So that's a value investor's edge. What do growth investors bring to the table? They believe markets are pretty good about assessing the value of assets in place. They believe that markets mess up, make mistakes in assessing the value of growth. And they also believe that they can, they, their skill set is in assessing the value of growth assets a little better than the market. The bottom line is both value and growth investors care about value. The question is what they value. Value investors focus on assets in place. Growth investors focus on growth assets, which means that growth investors are going to be drawn not towards mature companies, but towards growing companies where they feel the market has made mistakes. So with that difference in place, let's look at the history of value versus growth. Here, I'm going to revert back to the lazy way of categorizing value and growth. In fact, the classic defining variable for value versus growth has been price to book ratios. The value factor, when people talk about factor analysis, is built around price to book. This graph, which looks like an incredible amount of zigs and zags, looks at value and growth stocks across time. Let's cut to the chase. If you look at 1927 through 2019, that's 92 years of history, here's what you see. Value stocks, low price to book stocks, have done significantly better than high price to book stocks. In fact, take a, take, take a look at the two end deciles. The lowest decile are the stocks that in each period were in the lowest price to book ratios. They earn more than 16% on an annual basis as opposed to the highest price to book stocks. Until 2010, this was the end of the story. Value stocks are better than growth stocks. Based on the history, it seemed like value investing had won. 
After all, low price to book stocks have consistently outlived. Well, the last decade brought a rethinking of that result. If you look at this table, I've broken down lowest price to book versus highest price to book stocks by decade. And it's quite clear that in the last 10 years, the results have been reversed. It's the highest price to book stocks that have done the best relative to the lowest price to book stocks. And that's been quite a shock to value investors. In fact, many value investors, when pushed to explain why value investing was not working, pointed to the 2008 crisis. The Fed's reaction to that crisis, low interest rates, pretty much blamed everybody but themselves for what had happened. Implicit in that argument was the belief that this was all going to be reversed and that value investing would rediscover its rightful role at the top of the investing food chain. Well, we're in a crisis. Let's see if that's happened. I took three slices of traditional value investing. One is low PE stocks versus high PE. And you can see already, if you look at the last column, that low PE stocks have actually done worse than high PE stocks during this crisis. So if you're buying low PE stocks expecting safety, it's not happened. What about low price to book? Same results. The lowest price to book stocks have underperformed relative to the highest price to book stocks. And finally, I looked at high dividend yield. After all, value investing says you should buy stocks with high dividends. They're safer. And I'm just looking at dividends, not buybacks. And here again, the results don't support value investing. It's the lowest dividend yield stocks that have done better than the highest dividend yield stocks. In fact, even non-dividend paying stocks have beaten out high dividend yield stocks. So in summary, if you listen to value investors and you bought low PE stocks with high dividend yields, why? Because you wanted safety in a crisis. In this crisis, they haven't delivered at least so far. Well, there's a long, there's a, this is a long race. Maybe they will eventually win, but so far at least, there is no evidence that you're seeing a reversal back to the old time value wins over growth. Let's talk about active versus passive. In passive investing, of course, you make asset allocation decisions based on your risk aversion and need for liquidity. You don't pick stocks. You invest in ETFs and index funds, and you essentially take a very passive role to investing. In active investing, you invest based on asset classes that you think are undervalued or underpriced, so you do market timing. You might pick individual stocks and individual bonds because you think you can pick the cheaper, the more undervalued stocks and bonds. In other words, in active investing, you're looking at a spectrum of different philosophies, from charting to value investing to growth investing, even including activist value investing and venture capital investing. So this battle between active and passive has been going on a long time. The first blow against active investing was delivered in the 1970s when the first index funds were created. But active investing still continued to dominate all the way through the mid-90s. In fact, in the mid-90s, about 5% of money managed was in the hands of passive investors, 95% inactive. In the last 25 years, and especially in the last 10, you've seen an acceleration away from active to passive investing. In this graph, for instance, I look at 2010 through 2019, where the bulk of the move happened. The best way to graph how this change happened is to look at the funds flowing into and or flowing out of active and passive investing. Over this decade, funds flowed dramatically into passive investing vehicles. Now, ETFs, index funds, and you can see that in the green columns, that's funds flowing into active investing. The red is the funds flowing into or out of, uh, I'm sorry, funds flowing into passive investing. The red is funds flowing either into active investing, which happened for the first five years, but out for much of the last five years. The market share of passive investing has risen pretty dramatically over the last decade. And that's raised uh, some debate in active investing as to why that's happened. There again, if you look at the reasons, I think the reasons have always been there. And what happened in the last decade to accelerate things was the availability of choices. Let me explain. Active investing has always underperformed passive investing. As long as people have looked at it, in fact, the very first study of active investing looked at mutual funds in the 1960s. Michael Jensen at the University of Chicago looked at you know, 125 mutual funds, which doesn't sound like many right now, but at that time was a pretty comprehensive list. And he concluded that the average mutual fund, the professional money managers, delivered about 1.5% less than the index after adjusting for transactions costs. 
So, you know, that, that, that result has been remarkably robust through four, uh, four decades of people checking it out on different kinds of active investors different slices of funds, value funds, growth funds, long-term funds, short-term funds, different kinds of active investors from hedge funds to private equity. And in every single group, maybe after an initial spurt where that group might have delivered positive alphas more than they should have, they've all come back down to earth. The biggest reason for the shift away from active investing has been performance. That performance has always been bad, but it's become much more visible in the last 10 years because of information. So an investor who might have checked what, what his mutual fund did in the 1960s might have had no frame of reference to compare it to today. It's right in front of him. The other is your choices have become much richer as a passive investor. It used to be at one point in time that if you wanted to be a passive investor, you had to buy not just an index fund, but the S&P 500 index fund. Today, you have index funds in pretty much every category of investing. In addition to that, you got ETFs. You can invest in sectors, in, in, in countries. You can pretty much invest in any subset of stocks without hiring a portfolio manager to pick stocks for you. Those two factors, I think, explain the shift away from active investing. But of course, active investors have concluded that it's just the times, that this too shall pass. In fact, active investors believe that in a crisis, investors are going to wake up from the passive investing dream and discover how much they need active investors. Well, active investing now has its chance. It has a crisis. And if active investing truly works, this is the kind of crisis you pay people to manage money for you, right? If you have market timing expertise, you should be getting me out of equities, at least not, maybe not before the crisis. Nobody might have seen it coming, but early enough in the crisis that I avoided the worst damage. And not just that, but get me back into stocks as they started rising. So if you're a market timer, you can't ask for a better time. And if you're a stock selector, maybe in this crisis where some stocks have been likely affected and some have been deeply impacted, you should be able to pick the right stocks. Now, it's still early in the crisis and the results are still coming in. But if you look at the mutual fund performance in the first quarter of 2020, and remember, the bulk of the damage in stocks happened before March 31st. So this is the quarter where you should have seen active investors shine. Basically, I've taken the Morningstar Mutual Fund Database sliced and, and I've looked at how they, they categorize these mutual funds into different groups. And in every single grouping bar two, the mutual funds have underperformed the relevant index. Morningstar, of course, creates indices for each of these mutual funds. And these are not, these are not abstract indices. You could, create, you could invest in ETFs that deliver the index. In, in the, in, across this, the, the, set, the nine different classes, you see that, that mutual funds have underperformed and across all mutual, in, in seven, and across all mutual funds, mutual funds have under-delivered by about 1.37%. I know that, that, that there is more to come and maybe mutual funds will, will get a chance to shine, but so far at least, there is no evidence that market timing and stock selection has worked for active investing. Now, I'll make my, you know, and I, these are purely my beliefs, so don't take them as, as biblical propositions. I think coming out of this crisis, you're going to see even more money flow out of passive, from active to passive investing. Because there are people who've held on to active investing because they think it'll work in a period like this one. And if it doesn't work in a crisis like this, there'll be even more money flowing into, act, into passive investing. Does that mean that active investing will cease to exist? I don't think so. It will shrink. It will become a smaller business, fewer people hire, you know, employed in that business. But I do think there's a role for active investors in, a, in any market. In fact, I can't visualize a market that's all passive investing all the time. But I think the active investors who remain will have to bring something to the table. They'll have to get past the denial that I see collectively across active investing and the delusion that somebody else is to blame and take responsibility. If you want to take something away from the table, you've got to bring something to the table. And I think the active investors who survive will be the ones who bring something to the table. Finally, small cap premium. Small cap premium was born in academic finance. Finance researchers discovered in the late, late 70s, one of the first anomalies noticed in finance, that small cap stocks earned a premium over the average stock after adjusting for risk. 
Hence was born the small cap premium. And that premium has played out in multiple ways in practice. There are investors who allocated a disproportionately large amount of their portfolios to small cap funds on the expectation that small cap funds will outperform. In private company appraisal or public company valuations, you often see a small cap premium added to discount rates. And the source of this premium is actually very simple. It comes from looking at the historical data. If you go back all the way to the 1920s, 1927, and look at the returns from 1927 through 2019, small cap stocks have delivered significantly higher returns than not just large cap stocks in the market. In fact, across the last 92 years of data, small cap stocks have delivered about 3.5% more after adjusting for risk on a valuated basis than the rest of the market, than the average stock. You're saying there. That's the basis of the small cap premium. What people who push for the small cap premium don't seem to mention is that's true if you go all the way back to 1927. Since 1981, the small cap premium has pretty much disappeared. In fact, since 1981, small cap stocks have delivered 0.17% less than the average stock. There has been no small cap premium for four decades. And you can see that when you see the breakdown of small cap versus large cap stocks as you go through the decades. In the early decades, the difference is not just always positive, but it's positive in very big. And if you look since 1980, that difference has, has shrunk and pretty much gone to zero. And in fact, between 2010 and 2019, there was no small cap premium. Now, again, small cap investors have argued that maybe in a crisis, things are going to shift back. It's still early in this crisis again, and I hate to repeat that, but so far at least, small cap stocks have not delivered. It's the smallest cap stocks that have been punished the most in this crisis, large, rather than the largest cap stocks. So in summary, here's what I see. Whether it's value versus growth, active versus passive, or small versus large, if the hope was that somehow this crisis would upend what had happened over the last decade and put things back to the way they used to be, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the reality is there are fundamental reasons why value is underperforming growth, why active is seeing money go to passive, and why small cap, the small cap premium has disappeared. And none of those fundamentals have really changed because of this crisis. In fact, you could argue that this crisis could strengthen the forces that were causing those shifts that you saw in the last decade to become even stronger. We'll see, because the numbers will continue to roll in, and I'll keep updating these numbers as we go through. Thank you very much for listening.